this presentation will focus on the early years of the Cold War. Uh, and it really found its origin in World War II and in the aftermath of World War II. Let's just do a little survey of the world during the Cold War. Uh, you had three different categories, really. You had the United States and its allies, the Soviet Union and its allies, and the non-aligned countries, uh, those that did not side with one, one uh, side or the other in the Cold War. Uh, China is sort of a special case. Uh, it is more on the Soviet side, but there was a lot of tension between the Chinese and the Soviets. So you'll notice uh, Europe here is divided, uh, most of it, into the two camps, uh, into the uh, Soviet satellites, those who uh, supported the Soviet Union, and the NATO members who uh, supported the United States, or generally. Okay, so this is the world of the Cold War. Now, when we say Cold War, uh, we're talking about uh, a, a, an atmosphere of tension in which it wasn't usually hot war, but it wasn't peace either. Uh, peace is what we have with Canada. Uh, even if we don't always agree with them on everything, no one is worried uh, that there's going to be uh, attacks across the border. It's a, an undefended border. Um, the Cold War uh, always carried the possibility that there could be a hot war. And in fact, there were hot wars that broke out during the Cold War, such as the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, uh, the war in Afghanistan. Those were all part of the Cold War. Now, a lot of this uh, has its origins at Yalta in February of 1945. This is a conference in the Crimea uh, the Southern Soviet Union, attended by the Big Three, where you have Winston Churchill on the left, Franklin Roosevelt in the center, and Joseph Stalin on the right. Now, Yalta really dealt with four critical issues. One was Poland. Uh, Stalin promised free elections in Eastern Europe, including Poland, especially Poland. Uh, he broke the promise. Uh, and this was the source of an enormous amount of uh, tension in the years that followed. Um, the second issue was Japan. Uh, the Soviets agreed at Yalta to enter the war against Japan three months after Germany's surrender. Uh, now, it's important to realize that the country that wanted this uh, was the United States. Franklin Roosevelt was advised by his uh, military uh, associates or uh, attaches, aides, that uh, they really weren't sure that the atomic bomb was going to, to work. Um, so uh, Roosevelt was concerned about the loss of American life in any invasion of Japan. Uh, so, and since the Soviets had the largest ground army in the world, uh, he uh, encouraged them, he asked them to enter the war against Japan. Now, the Soviets, of course, were interested in gaining territory in that part of the world, uh, and that's why they agreed to it. Uh, and, in fact, uh, Germany surrendered on May 8th, and three months later, uh, on August 8th, the Soviet Union entered the war against Japan. The third issue was the United Nations. Uh, you'll remember uh, Woodrow Wilson's frustration uh, when his uh, greatest goal, the establishment of a, of a League of Nations, was not joined by the United States. Uh, this time, the U.S. did join this international organization. Uh, it was structured in terms of a General Assembly and a Security Council. The General Assembly, Assembly gives one vote to each member nation. Uh, and uh, the, which uh, grew to uh, uh, some are roughly around 150 nations uh, and beyond. Uh, the General Assembly doesn't have a lot of power. Uh, the major powers were not willing to let uh, Luxembourg or, or Mali, for example, have as much uh, voting power as the United States or the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, the General Assembly isn't where the real power is. The, the Security Council does have uh, some power, 
Uh, but even there, uh, there are five nations in the, in the United Nations who have veto power. Uh, the Security Council uh, began with 11 nations. It later expanded to 15. Uh, but five nations could, you know, any one of the five nations could veto, could stop any action of the Security Council. Uh, and those nations would be the United States, the Soviet Union, uh, Britain, France, and China. Now, China at that time meant nationalist China. China had not yet become a communist country. Uh, the fourth issue was what would happen to Germany after the war. Uh, re very mindful of the uh, rebirth of Germany, the rise of Germany again, uh, only two decades after the end of World War I. Uh, the major powers agreed that Germany would be divided into four zones of occupation. Uh, and Berlin, the capital city, would itself be divided into four zones as well. Uh, this is what the map of uh, Germany was going to look like. Um, the uh, British and U.S. zones were here. The French zone uh, consisted of these areas of Germany that were right on the French border. No surprise there. They're interested in, in preventing any future attacks. Uh, the British zone is nearest to Britain. The U.S. zone is this area right here. Uh, and the Soviet zone is here. Now, the, Germany um, is a smaller country uh, than it was before the war. Uh, but these are the four major zones of occupation. And then Berlin is divided into uh, the same uh, idea of four zones. You have a British, a French, a Soviet, and an American zone within the city of Berlin. Now, uh, uh, after a fairly short time, after the end of the war, the three western zones united. Uh, so the British, French, and U.S. zones united into what became known as West Germany, the Soviet zone became known as East Germany, and in Berlin the same thing, the three western zones became West Berlin and the Soviet zone became East Berlin. I don't know what happened there. Here we go. Okay, apparently we're still recording. Uh, sorry for that interruption. Okay, we have the, uh, the zones of Germany here. And this line uh, became known as the Iron Curtain. Um, you'll notice that in Austria, uh, that was originally divided into zones of occupation as well. But Austria was a much smaller and, and less uh, uh, problematic country than Germany. And uh, both sides agreed that if Austria would be not aligned, if they wouldn't side with either East or West, that it could be reunified. And that's what happened. So that's why after these initial divisions, uh, the Iron Curtain uh, followed the eastern boundary of Austria and it became a non-aligned nation. Uh, okay. Uh, this was the, uh, the phrase that you heard throughout the Cold War, the Iron Curtain. Uh, and travel uh, was restricted behind the Iron Curtain. You could not, uh, ordinary citizens could not travel to the West. Uh, Western citizens needed special visas, permissions to enter the East. Uh, this was a, a highly militarized and high, heavily guarded border. Now, uh, Winston Churchill coined the term Iron Curtain. He visited uh, Harry Truman's home state of Missouri in 1946 um, and delivered what came to be known as the Iron Curtain speech. You can fi find this uh, by following this link. The link is not live on this uh, audio commentary. It is on the uh, slide that, on the regular uh, slides that are posted. Now, both sides uh, dealt with, with myths in the Cold War. Now, let me just define the word myth briefly. A myth is something that uh, is, closely, is closely believed, uh, strongly believed. 
Uh, it may be true, it may be false. The point is not whether it's true or false. The point is that it's a strong belief and that the belief is not necessarily tied to any real evidence. Now, the U.S. had some myths about the Cold War. They, they decided that the Soviets had, had started the Cold War because they wanted Eastern Europe. Well, the problem with that interpretation is uh, that the Soviets were acting like communists, but they were also acting like Russians. Uh, we'll, we'll speak about that a bit more when we, when we look at the map of Eastern Europe. Uh, the U.S. believed that the Soviet goal was world domination because you can find statements uh, in official communist writings uh, that call for that. Uh, but Stalin didn't necessarily act that way. Uh, they assume that communism is monolithic. That's a word that means one, literally one stone, uh, and that uh, a communist is a communist, whether it's a Chinese communist or a Soviet communist or a Cuban communist or uh, an Albanian communist. A communist is a communist, and they're all the same. Uh, and this turned out to be not true. It was, it was much more complicated than that. Uh, they also assume that no one voluntarily chooses communism. Well, uh, some do and some do not. Uh, but there were people who uh, were so uh, desperate uh, and so disillusioned with the capitalist system that they did choose communism. That didn't mean that they necessarily endorsed it over the long term. Uh, but there's a lot of diversity, a lot of variety in what people actually preferred. Uh, the U.S. believed that their success, economic success, proved the superiority of freedom and capitalism over communism and a, a planned economy. Uh, most economic historians probably uh, accept this idea. So as you can see, these myths are strongly held beliefs. Uh, some of them are more true than others. Now, on the Soviet side, uh, they assumed that the United States and Britain let them bleed in World War II uh, by not opening a Western Front. Now, the fact is that the Soviet Union lost somewhere between 20 and 30 million people in the war, uh, by far the, the highest death toll of any of the countries involved in the war. Uh, there were issues, uh, problems with uh, the D-Day invasion, with opening a Western Front too soon, for example, the need to subdue uh, German U-boats in order to get everything across the Atlantic that would be needed for the invasion. Uh, so th this myth, I think most historians would say, was, was an oversimplification. Um, they assumed that the U.S. wanted the end of communism. That one was true. They did. Uh, they assumed that history was on their side. Uh, as Marx said, that you know, the, the overall uh, movement of history is toward communism and away from competing systems. That has turned out not to be true. Um, they assumed that the U.S. was not really a democratic country, but run by Wall Street. That is a matter that is heavily debated right down to the present day. Um, probably could be considered partially true and partially false. Uh, they assumed that capitalist nations were imperialistic by nature, uh, that they uh, controlled other parts of the world for economic purposes. There certainly is a definite element of truth to that, uh, but it's but the the reality is, uh, I think, more complicated. Those are my opinions. Uh, let's take a, the, a look at the map of Cold War Europe. Um, Here's the Iron Curtain right here. Uh, now, you noticed uh, Poland and East Germany and Czechoslovakia and Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria are all within uh, the Soviet sphere of influence. They're all behind the Iron Curtain, as the people said at that time. Now, the question is, why? Is this because the Soviets are uh, mainly intent on spreading communism, or is it because um, that they're trying to protect themselves against future invasions. Remember the history of invasions of the Soviet Union from the West. Uh, in 1812, it was Napoleon. In 1914, it was Germany. In 1941, it was Germany again. Uh, so the question we have to ask is, 
even if the, the Soviet Union were still Russia and still run by czars, would not czars have wanted uh, just as much to control these countries of Eastern and Central Europe uh, to avoid uh, another invasion of the Soviet Union? So was Stalin acting like a communist or was he acting like a Russian? Uh, sorting that out is not always that easy. Uh, you'll notice that Poland is, is a very critical and large country. Uh, and the issue of uh, whether uh, the Soviets would permit free elections was important. When they did not, a lot of people blamed Roosevelt. Uh, the problem with that interpretation is that the Soviets were in physical control of Poland. Uh, and the United States was in no position and, and certainly was not in, in any kind of mood to launch World War III uh, and attack uh, the, uh, try to reclaim Poland. Uh, the, the mood of the country would not have stood for uh, a new war on the heels of the biggest war in human history. So, uh, you know, when, when people said Roosevelt gave away Poland, the question is, how can you give away what you don't possess? So, you know, it, it's, it's oversimplifying it to say that he simply gave away Poland. I don't think he did. Um, now, there were two groups in the United States. We can call them doves and hawks. Uh, the doves uh, said the Soviets are acting like Russians, you know, as, as we discussed just a couple of minutes ago, uh, and that any Russian leader would do what they're doing in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the hawks said they're acting like communists. Uh, the, the doves said... If we are too aggressive around the world, uh, throwing our weight around, for example, by dropping the atomic bombs on Japan and by uh, making all sorts of belligerent statements and by spreading American military bases around the world, they said, this simply provokes the Soviets. The Hawks said just the opposite. They said what emboldens or provokes the Soviets is American military weakness. So one side was saying, you know, we need to be stronger against the Soviets. The other side said, we're overdoing it, uh, and it's that very uh, pro uh, extension of American power that is creating a lot of the hostility. So these were really incompatible points of view. You, could, you couldn't believe both at the same time. Uh, if we come back to this uh, map of Cold War Europe, uh, we'll see here that uh, East and West Germany are now firmly established as separate countries. Um, and you'll notice this uh, island uh, called West Berlin, which is part of West Germany, but is physically separated from West Germany. That would be a source of enormous conflict uh, during the Cold War. You'll also notice that, that to the south, Greece and Turkey are not uh, inside the Iron Curtain. Uh, and this these became a major uh, point of contention in the early Cold War. Uh, were the Soviets interested in uh, controlling these areas? Uh, and, uh, and, and it's not at all clear that they were. Uh, the Soviets were interested in controlling this waterway here uh, through the, the Sea of Marmara uh, and the Dardanelles uh, and the Bosporus. Uh, but Russian leaders for centuries had been interested in that. They wanted a warm water port and, and access to uh, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Um, so again, different interpretations of uh, what, what the, all of this really meant. Now in the late 40s, um, one of the things that made the Cold War more intense was that the U.S. and the Soviet Union no longer had a common enemy. Uh, there was something called the Grand Alliance in World War II. The United States and the Soviet Union and Britain were all allies. Uh, but the reason they were allies is that they had a common enemy, Germany. And now that Germany had been defeated, uh, there were no ties left. There were no reasons left for uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union to be allies. And that alliance quickly fell apart. Uh, in 1947, there was a revolution in uh, Greece. There was a communist side uh, attempting to overthrow the Greek monarchy. 
Uh, the question is, uh, was that supported by the Soviet Union? Uh, Stalin believed that Greece was a British sphere of influence, uh, and he he told Churchill that he really, uh, you know, didn't didn't think that uh, you know that Greece was an area, uh, you know, that that it was a British area. That it, he really wasn't that interested in it. Um, in the United States, it was seen as the spread of communism, and the result of that uh, was the Truman Doctrine. Uh, that basically said that the United States will offer aid to any country that is in danger of becoming communist. Uh, Greece had been uh, controlled or heavily influenced by Britain, uh, but Britain was economically desperate and informed the U.S. that they could no longer play a significant role in Greece. And at that point, the Truman Doctrine uh, kicked in. Truman sent major military aid to Greece, and it was successful in turning back the possibility of communism in that country. Uh, Truman saw the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan as two halves of the same walnut, he, he called them. Uh, the Marshall Plan was a massive program of aid uh, to the devastated countries of Europe. He actually offered it to Eastern Europe. The Soviets rejected it as a, a trick to, for the United States to gain influence. Um, and uh, so, so the Marshall Plan was uh, aid given to Western Europe, uh, to France, to Italy, to West Germany, and so on. This, was, uh, this accomplished a number of things. First of all, uh, it helped stop the spread of communism because the U.S. was worried that people uh, who were uh, destitute, who were desperate, uh, would be likely to turn to the communists, uh, and this gave them uh, economic assistance. Uh, secondly, uh, the Marshall Plan uh, was good for the U.S. economy. Uh, it, it functioned as a kind of stimulus because those, uh, those things that were sent there uh, were made in the United States largely. Uh, and, that, and, and thirdly, uh, by rebuilding the European economy, the United States was also rebuilding a market for the export uh, of American goods uh, at a later date. It was also uh, a humanitarian move. I wouldn't discount that motive. Uh, the United States genuinely felt, Americans felt genuinely uh, sympathetic uh, for the people of Europe who had been so devastated during the war. Uh, the U.S. was faced with three choices. They could uh, try to roll back communism uh, where it had already spread. That would have resulted in war. Uh, the U.S. rejected that option. Or they could have retreated into isolationism as uh, had existed in the, in the 30s. And, uh, uh, and, and in that case, uh, you know, whatever happened, happened, and Europe would not have been considered important to the United States. Now, that option was rejected as well. So the middle path was uh, to stop communism from spreading uh, beyond where it, it already was, uh, but not to aggressively try to roll it back. And that doctrine, which was in place for decades during the Cold War, is called containment. Now, it was containment that played a role in uh, the Berlin blockade and airlift. Uh, in 1948, uh, Stalin uh, closed down the uh, you know, ground traffic to Berlin. Uh, you know, rail traffic, road traffic, etc. Uh, and he thought that, you know, the, this would require Berlin to simply give in and then he could uh, gain control over it. He didn't like this island of Western influence in the middle of East Germany. Uh, Truman, again, faced three options. He could go to war over it. He rejected that. He could let Berlin go. He rejected that also. Uh, and the, the solution was an airlift. Uh, the United States sent massive numbers of flights uh, into uh, Berlin uh, for the better part of a year uh, and supplied all of the city's needs, a city of two and a half million people, West Berlin, and they supplied all of their needs from the air. Uh, and this was uh, uh, an enormous uh, project. Okay, this will be the end of part one 
uh, of uh, this presentation. There will be a part two.